Hello and welcome to section 2.7 on rotations in geometric algebra. First, let's create rotations. Rotations are generated by two unit vectors by successively reflecting a vector uh, to the planes that are perpendicular to those unit vectors. As is seen in this diagram, you first reflect A to the plane perpendicular to M and then you do it perpendicular to N to get to the vector C. It then comes to this. So you do successive uh, reflections, which are encoded in this equation right here. So you let R equal NM, and then you can express it by having R and the reverse of R around a vector A. And then this is actually called a rotor, which is defined by this equation. Hence a unit bivector in the plane created by the unit bivector, or unit vectors M and N is B of the bivector M and N, M wedge N over sine theta. And remember that this does square to negative one. And the reason why we use M wedge N, not N wedge M, is to preserve orientation specified by generating the bivector, which if you need proof of that, look back in the graphic on the last slide. And so you can define R as being equal to this, which is just polar decomposition of a complex number. So you can express it this way right here. Remember to replace I with the unit bivector of that plane though. Thus, this description encourages us to think of rotations as taking place in a plane. And the last equation that you saw gives a simple proof for why or for how the formula doesn't alter lengths or angles. And then you can do a simple proof for the inverse transformation. Now for constructing a rotor, say we want to rotate a unit vector A into a unit vector B, leaving all vectors that are perpendicular to them unchanged. This is done by a reflection perpendicular to the unit vector N, which is halfway between A and B. You create n by basically adding up a and b and then dividing by their magnitudes added together. This defines this rotor, which creates a simple rotation in the a wedge b plane. It thus follows that this equation holds, which is always possible for vectors in the plane of rotation. And if we return to polar form, we can express this just as an exponential times a vector. And this is an easy way to show that any vector C perpendicular to the A wedge B plane is unaffected by the rotors. And R and negative R rotors generate exact same rotation. So there's a two to one map between rotors and rotation. Now for rotating multivectors, suppose that by vector B is equal to A wedge B, and then you rotate both vectors. What's the expression of the resulting bivector? Find that we use the same exact equation, and so it turns out that this formula actually applies to all multivectors for rotating them. Now for the rotor composition law, if you compose multiple rotations into one rotor, you can express it as a group combination, which is why it's called the group combination law for rotors. They form a continuous group called a Lie group. Now let's explore a surprising consequence. Suppose r sub 1 is fixed and we say r sub 2 is equal to an exponential raised to the negative bivector theta over 2. Now let's take some vector c on a 2 pi trip back to itself. We notice that the rotor changes sign under a 2 pi rotation which is usually a quantum mechanical phenomenon related to the existence of fermions. But we can now see that the result is classical and is only a consequence of the rotor description of rotations. An example of this happening in quantum mechanics is how the electron from the Pauli equations change sign under two pi rotations. Now, the difference between R and negative R is only purely geometric. So if we want to rotate a vector E1 into vector E2, the rotor for this is given here. If we rotate in a positive sense through pi over 2, the final rotor is given here. And then if we want to rotate in a negative sense, then the rotor is given here. Again, for some reason, this glitched and raised it to, an, um, to a power, but it should this right here should be the exact same as this. And so rotating in a negative sense is just a rotor being negative of the other one. Therefore, sign records the handedness of the rotation. And then there's some stuff that you that's very interesting to know, but it's not super useful at the moment. But basically there's compound effect decomposition right here, which you can basically prove that given these two rotors and then this rotor, which is defined as these, you can create these half angle uh, relations. Now for Euler angles, a standard way to parameterize 
rotations is via the, these three Euler angles, phi, theta, and c. These are defined to rotate an initial set of axes, e sub 1, e sub 2, and e sub 3, onto a new set. First, we rotate about the e sub 3 axis, which is the e sub 1, e sub 2 plane, counterclockwise through an angle phi. The rotor for this is given by r sub phi. Next, we rotate about the axis formed by the transformed e sub 1 axis through an angle theta. The plane is given here, thus the rotor is r sub theta. The intermediate rotor is r primed, which is equal to r theta times r phi. Finally, we rotate again about the transformed e sub 3 axis through an angle psi. The correct plane for this is given, thus the final rotor is this. Which brings us to the end rotor, which in reality is quite simple and is much easier, easier to visualize and to compute than the equivalent matrix formula, which I have included down here. I, for one, would prefer to use this exponential equation right here rather than use these matrices. Therefore, we've little reason to use Euler angles and calculations in the traditional sense. Thank you for watching. I hope that it was informative and next episode will be section 3.1, which is the first start on classical mechanics elementary principles in geometric algebra.